Years ago, when I was working at Lutheridge, our church camp up in North Carolina, one of my favorite parts of working there was the summer staff orientation time. Before the summer would begin, all the staff, the counselors and the senior staff, would come together for a time of training, for learning, and reviewing what it meant to be a counselor, how to do the job, how to take care of campers, how a camp week worked, everything you needed to know for a good and faithful summer. And the best part, the best part of staff orientation to me were all the skits we got to do, the, the silly skits, the skits that would help us demonstrate the right way and the wrong way to do things. So, for instance, what we do is we we have a group of counselors who would maybe do a skit about the right way to behave in the dining hall. You know, how to be orderly and stay in your seat and pack the dishes and so on. And then we have a group of counselors who would show the wrong way to do it, just for fun, just for laughs. Or maybe, uh, for a more serious topic, we'd have a group of counselors who would show how to take care of a homesick camper. You know, how to keep them calm and active and let them know that they can make it through the week. And then, just for fun, we have a group of counselors who would show the completely wrong way to do it. Or maybe a skit about how to handle emergencies that would arise at camp. You know, the right way. And then a hilarious skit about how to panic and completely lose control when emergencies came along. Well, it was for fun. But it was also to give a real clear, real-world example of the right way and the ridiculously wrong way to be a counselor. In some ways, that's kind of what Jesus is doing in this Gospel reading today. He gives a right way and a wrong way, a right way and a wrong way. But, to be honest with you, it's not that clear which is the most ridiculous. I mean, listen to this. Which of these sounds more ridiculous? Repay evil for evil, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or do not resist someone strikes you on the cheek, off with the other. Or which sounds more ridiculous? Don't let him, anyone take your coat, or if anyone wants to take your coat, give your cloak as well. You should hate your enemies, <coughs> love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Ridiculous? Well, it's obvious that Jesus' words are challenging. They go against our natural instincts to take care of ourselves and to keep away from us those things and those people that might harm us, who might hate us. But let's remember what Jesus is doing in this passage. He's continuing to share his Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' grand vision of what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like here and now. So Jesus says these kinds of challenging things here, just like he says them elsewhere. Too. After all, this is the same Lord who said things like, whoever wants to be great in the kingdom of God must be servant of all. Whoever wants to follow me should deny themselves and take up their cross. You see, the consistent message of Jesus is not one of self preservation. It's not about taking care of ourselves and our own. It's not about looking out for our own well-being and making sure that we are okay. The message of Jesus over and over again is one of self-giving, of giving up and giving away ourselves. And that's what Jesus does, isn't it? 
I mean, his life is a living example of self-giving. Jesus doesn't seek to preserve his own life, but he gives it away, gives it up freely. So what does, what do Jesus' words about giving and not just looking out for ourselves, what do they mean for us? Well, we all probably know people who do this sort of thing all the time, don't we? Think about those who spend so much of their time and energy caring for an ailing loved one, for example. Or what about someone who is in a relationship that's very strained, and they pour themselves out into that relationship to try to make it work? Or even those who give away so much of themselves financially to people or to causes they believe in, even to the point of sacrifice. Well, if you or anyone you know is doing those kinds of things, then take heart. Be encouraged by Jesus' words, for you are living the kingdom's call. Such words about giving, about self-giving, aren't just for us individually. I think they're also a word for the church, for this congregation, and every congregation. So much of the time in church, we think of how to, how to preserve and how to maintain. We think about how to care for uh, a building and our stuff and how to plan for the future. So this place, will be okay. Now, those kinds of instincts come from a good place. We want this place to last and to be a faithful testament to the work of God, but preserving and maintaining isn't really what Jesus is talking about. Is it? Jesus doesn't call us to self-preservation. Jesus calls us to self-giving. So what might that mean for a church, for this church, for any church, in any place? I remember when I was serving a church in West Virginia years ago, the congregation had gathered together during the season of Advent for some study and reflection time. And one night, as a way to encourage people to think about big things about church, I asked this question. I said, if our church tomorrow unexpectedly received one million dollars, what would we do? Well, several people offered up answers. One person said, we would buy up all the property surrounding the church and create our own little kingdom right here on this block of West Another said, well, our building is in need of so much renewal and upkeep inside. We could just update everything and make it look beautiful in here. Another person said, well, we, we could put the money away and then maybe sometime down the road we could use it for scholarships for young people from our church, maybe for them to go to a Lutheran college or even to seminary. The last person, the last person to speak was an an older man, his name was Harlan, and he was a retired math teacher, very soft-spoken. And he stood up and he simply said, if we received a million dollars, we'd just give it away and let the Lord bless it. Give it all away and let the Lord bless it. He was the last person to speak because who can argue with that man? But also because he was right. In some way, everyone knew he was right. What if for us, the question wasn't how can we survive or how can we grow or how can we have a future, but rather, what can we give away next? What as a church can we give away? And on a more personal level, what if we didn't ask, how can we make ourselves look good? Or how can we be more successful? Or how can I 
do for myself, but rather, how can I love an enemy, serve another, or give myself away? You see, Jesus' words, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love your enemies, they aren't just cliches. They're signposts that point us toward God's kingdom. It's the kingdom Jesus proclaims here in Matthew, the kingdom he has made you a part of, the kingdom God desires to build in this world through our very lives. So what is the good news for us this day? Well, the good news is Jesus has loved you even to the point of giving all, giving everything, giving his life to redeem your life, he gave himself in an act of love for neighbors and enemies, for saints and sinners, for you and me. And in response, he invites us, he calls us to live with our hearts tuned towards God's kingdom. And he gives us an example, a clear example, the perfect example of what life in his kingdom is to be. And the example is Jesus himself. We are to be like him. Not self-serving, but self-giving. 